Hey everybody, today I have a special treat for you. So as you probably know, I have a Patreon and one of the perks that I do on that Patreon is since October 2018, every month, I've missed a couple, but most months, <laughs> I have been doing a live streamed play reading of a script or a play with a lot of my wonderful and very talented friends. And at this point, I have over 30 different readings. <laughs> So I figured it was time to let one loose into the public and I let my patrons vote on which one they thought would be the best suited to put out publicly and they chose one of my favorite movies of all time, The Princess Bride, which was the first reading we did over Zoom when lockdown started almost exactly a year ago. This reading is so fun. It features Tim De La Motte, Lauren Lopez, Joey Richter, Gabe Greenspan, Sean Persaud, of course, Sinead Persaud, Alec McNamara, and myself. And if you enjoy this, there is a lot more where that came from on my Patreon. <laughs> there are so many, seriously, so many. And if you pledge at the $25 level, you have access to a Dropbox that has every single one of the readings I've ever done. That is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of content. If that's a little pricey for you, at the $15 level, you get to see the live stream that I do each month. This month I'm doing The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, part one. It's very long. Last month I did Fellowship. We got a thing going here. But of course, no worries if Patreon's not for you, you get to enjoy this one free of charge. So without further Without further ado, please enjoy our reading of The Princess Bride. All right. There we go. Stream is live. In the meeting. Is it live? It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Pretend that I made a bunch of snacks. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Right before oh, yeah. we got on this, we went, should we make popcorn? And then we didn't. <laughs> I thought about bringing snacks as well and just being oh. like, oh, it's a Mary Kate reading. We are, honestly, y'all messed up because I got banana bread. Whoa! So Damn. great. Okay, people are here and watching. Very fun. Um, uh, just to know that I planned out my day. Oh, I didn't see we had Kitty. We have Kitty. <laughs> oh, there is Kitty. Hello, Kitty. Okay. I didn't plan out my day at all. Right, and I'm gonna have to go put my laundry in the dryer. <laughs> uh, you know what? That's cool. That Hell is yeah. real life. Hell yeah! That's part of the movie, if I remember correctly. <laughs> that's like a big scene. That that's his. That's the kid's plot line, right? That's how they got out of there. Uh -huh. We'll just take a little quickie break. I'm so sorry. I'm a real dum dum. That's um, so funny. Thank you for watching. Um, well, I'll see you again. Thank you so much to you guys for agreeing to do this um, for my Patreon. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that uh, we couldn't all get together and I could stuff you with snacks, but this <laughs> is a nice alternative. Yeah. Um, yay, let's go around and introduce ourselves and uh, who, which roles were we reading? I'm Mary Kate and I'm reading Buttercup. I am Sean Prasad. I'm reading Wesley and the kid. And the, and the clergyman. Lucky. Okay. I'm, um, it, it highlighted me, so I'm talking next. Um, I'm Sinead, and I'm playing Mother, Valerie, and others. Wonderful. I'm Alec, and I will be the narrator. Mm. And by that, he means stage direction. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Same thing. Hi, I'm Joey. I'm going to be reading Inigo, uh, uh, Inigo Montoya, uh, the assistant brute, and King. <laughs> okay. I'm Lauren, and I am reading Vizini. Who's Wallace Shawn's character? Oh right, God! I haven't watched. This movie. <laughs> I haven't watched this movie in like a decade. Oh, it's um, so good. It's so good. I don't know why we didn't watch it before this. Love it. Albino and Yellen. Great. Gabe? Uh, Gabe Greenspan, 510 SAG AFTRA, and I will be reading uh, Humperdink and Miracle Max. Right. Mm -hmm. And Tim. And finally, I'm Tim Delamont, and I will be reading Grandpa, uh, Fezzik, and Rugen. Yay. Mm. Um, 
guys. This is going to be so fun. It's just the best movie. Um, Real. And just a reminder, as always, this is so chill. So if you need to get out for any reason, please feel free. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, shall we? Shall we get into it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Princess Bride. Oh, man. Cool. All Eight right. On a video game on a computer screen. The game is in progress as a sick coughing sound is heard. Cut to <laughs> this kid lying in bed, coughing, pale, one sick cookie. Maybe he's seven or eight or nine. He holds a remote in one hand, presses it, and the video game moves a little bit. Then he's hit by another spasm of coughing, puts the remote down. His room is monochromatic, grays and blues, mildly high tech. We're in the present day, and this is a middle class house somewhere in the suburbs. Cut to this kid's mother. As she enters, goes to him, fluffs his pillows, kisses him, and briefly feels his forehead. She's worried. It doesn't show during this. You feeling any better? A little bit. Guess what? What? Your grandfather's here. Mom, can't you tell him that I'm sick? You are sick. That's why he's here. Go pinch my cheek. I hate that. Maybe he won't. The kid shoots her an unsure look as we cut to the kid's grandfather bursting into the room, kind of rumpled, but the eyes are bright. He has a bright package tucked under one arm as, as we immediately go to the kid pinching his cheek. Hey, how's this sick, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> the kid gives his mother an I told you so look. The mother ignores it, beats a retreat. I think I'll leave you two pals. And she's gone. There's an uncomfortable silence then. I brought you a special present. What is it? Open it up. The kid does. He does his best to smile. A book? That's right. When I was your age, television was called books. And this <laughs> is a special book. It was used. It was the book my father used to read to me when I was sick. And I used to read it to your father. And today, I'm going to read it to you. Has it got any sports in it? <laughs> Are you kidding? Fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. Cut to the two of them as the grandfather sits in a chair by the bed. It doesn't sound too bad. I'll try and stay awake. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's very nice of you. Your vote of confidence is overwhelming. All right. Hmm. The Princess Bride by S. Morgenstern. Chapter 1. Buttercup was raised on a small farm in the country of Florin. Dissolved to the story he's reading about as the monochromatic look of the bedroom is replaced by the dazzling color of the English countryside. Her favorite pastimes were riding her horse and tormenting the farm boy that worked there. His name was Wesley, but she never called him that. Isn't that a wonderful beginning? Yeah, it's really good. Nothing gave Buttercup as much pleasure as ordering Wesley around. Buttercup's farm, day. Buttercup is standing, holding the reins of her horse, while in the background, Wesley, in the stable doorway, looks at her. Buttercup is in her late teens, doesn't care much about clothes, and she hates brushing her long hair. So she isn't as attractive as she might be, but she's still probably <laughs> the most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah, I'm <laughs> okay. Probably. Probably. Farm boy. Polish my horse's saddle. I want to see my face shining in it by morning. As you wish. Wesley is perhaps half a dozen years older than Buttercup, and maybe as handsome as she is beautiful. He gazes at her as she walks away. Granddad. Oh, as you wish, was all he ever said to her. Dissolved to Wesley, outside, chopping wood, Buttercup drops two large buckets near him. Farm boy, fill these with water. Please. As you wish. <laughs> he leaves, his eyes stay on her. She stops, turns. He manages to look away as now her eyes stay on him. <laughs> that day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. And even Butter more amazing, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's a buttercup in the kitchen, dusk, Wesley enters with an armload of firewood. And even more amazing was the day she realized she truly loved him back. Farm oh boy, fetch me that pitcher. He gets it, hands it to her. They are standing very close to each other, gazing into each other's eyes. As you wish. Mm. Now he turns, moves outside. 
Dissolve two. Wesley and Bud Pup outside his tiny hovel in the red glow of sunset. They are locked in a passionate kiss. Hold it, hold it. <laughs> Cut to the kids' room. What is this? Are you trying to trick me? Where's the sports? Is this a kissing book? Wait, just wait. Well, when does it get good? Keep your shirt on. Let me read. Wesley had no money for marriage, so he packed up his few belongings and left the farm to seek his fortune across the sea. Cut to Wesley and Buttercup. They stand near the gate to the farm, locked in an embrace. It was a very emotional time for Buttercup. Oh, yeah. I don't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> I fear I'll never see you again. Of course you will. But what if something happens to you? Hear this now. I will come for you. But how can you be sure? This is true love. You think this happens every day? He smiles at her, she smiles too, throws her arms so tightly around him, they kiss. Then as Wesley walks away, Buttercup watches him go. Wesley didn't reach his destination. His ship was attacked by the dread pirate Roberts, who never left captives alive. When Buttercup got news that Wesley was murdered. Murdered by pirates is good. Cut to close up, Buttercup staring out the window of her room. She went into her room and shut the door, and for days neither slept nor ate. I will never love again. Hold on her face, perfect <laughs> and perfectly sad. Aww. Dissolve to Florin Castle, day. The main courtyard of Florin, replete with townspeople, livestock, and a bustling marketplace. Five years later, the main square of Florin City was filled as never before to hear the announcement of the great Prince Humperdinck's bride-to-be. Cut to Prince Humperdinck, a man of incredible power and bearing, standing in his royal robes on a castle balcony, three others standing behind him, an old couple with crowns, the aging king and queen, and a dark bearded man who seems, who seems the prince's match in strength. This is Count Rugen. My people, a month from now, our country will have its 500th anniversary. On that sundown, I shall marry a lady who has come, who was once a commoner like yourselves, <laughs> but perhaps you will not find her common now. Would you like to meet her? Yes! yes. <laughs> Cut to a giant staircase leading to the crowd, and as a figure just begins to become visible. Cut to the crowd, as they see the figure we haven't yet. And if there is such a thing as collective action, then this crowd collectively holds its breath. Cut to the staircase as the figure appears in the archway. It is Buttercup, and she is resplendent. My people, the Princess Buttercup! She descends the stairs and starts to move amongst the people, the crowd, and they do a very strange thing. With no instruction at all, they suddenly go to their knees, great waves of people kneeling and cut to Buttercup, terribly moved. She stands immobile among her subjects, blinking back tears. Hold on her beauty for a moment. Buttercup's emptiness consumed her. Although the law of the land gave Humperdinck the right to choose his bride, she did not love him. Cut to Woodlands and Buttercup barreling along, controlling her horse easily. Despite Humperdinck's reassurance that she would grow to love him, the only joy she found was in her daily ride. Cut to a wooded glen, close to sundown, lovely, quiet, deserted. Buttercup suddenly reigns in. I think this, that's is, this is Zini's voice. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I did not look ahead. A word, my lady? Oh, I don't know who, I don't know what's happening. Cut to you. <laughs> this is perfect. Beyond them can be seen the waters of Florin Channel. The three men are not your everyday commuter types. Standing in front is a tiny man with the most angelic face. He is Sicilian and his name is Vicini. Beside him is a Spaniard, erect and taut as a blade of steel. His name is Inigo Montoya. Beside him is a giant. His name is Fezzik. We are but poor lost circus performers. Is there a village nearby? There is nothing nearby, not for miles. Then there will be no one to hear you scream. <laughs> he nods to the giant Fezzik, who merely reaches over, touches a nerve on Buttercup's neck, and the start of a scream is all she manages. Unconsciousness comes that fast as she starts to fall, cut to a tiny isolated spot at the edge of Florin Channel. A sailboat is moored, it's dusk now, shadows are long. Inigo, the Spaniard, busies his, himself getting the boat ready. 
cut to the giant pheasant carries Buttercup unconscious on board. Fitzini rips some tiny pieces of fabric from an army jacket and tucks them along the saddle of Buttercup's horse. There is about the entire operation a sense of tremendous skill and precision. What is that you're ripping? It's fabric from the uniform of an army officer of Gilder. Gilder. Who is Gilder? The country across the sea, the sworn enemy of Florin. Go! The horse takes off. They start for the boat. Once the horse reaches the castle, the fabric will make the prince suspect the Gilderans have the Gilderians have abducted his love. When he finds her body dead in the Gilder frontier, his suspicions will be totally confirmed. You never said anything about killing anyone. I've Is hired you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I've hired you to help me start a war. That's a prestigious line of work with a long and glorious tradition. I just don't think it's right. Killing an innocent girl. Am I going mad or did the word think escape your lips? You are not hired for your brains, you hippopotamic landmass. I agree with physic. Cut to close up, Vicini in a theory. Oh, the sod has spoken. What happens to her is not truly your concern. I will kill her and remember this. Never forget this. And you cut to Inigo and Fezzik. As Vicini advances on them, nothing shows in Inigo's face, but Fezzik is panicked by Vicini. When I found you, you were so slobbering drunk you couldn't buy brandy. And you, sorry. <laughs> Did I cut you off? Sorry. No. And you, friendless, brainless, helpless, hopeless. Do you want me to send you back to where you were, unemployed in Greenland? Vizzini glares at him, then turns, leaves them. During this, Inigo has gone to, close to Fezzik, who is, ver who is very distressed at the insults he's just received as Inigo casts off. That, Vin that Vizzini, he can fuss. Fuss, fuss. I think he likes to scream at us. Probably he means no harm. He's really very short on charm. Oh, you have a great gift for rhyme. Yes, yeah, some of the time. <laughs> Enough of that! <laughs> as they sail off, we hear their voices as the boat recedes. Physic, are the rocks, are the rocks ahead? If they are, we'll all be dead. Okay, no more rhymes now, I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? <laughs> as Vicini screams, we... Ah! <laughs> the sailboat racing across the dark waters. Um, Inigo is at the helm. Fezzik stands near the body of the princess, whose eyelids flutter slightly. Or do they? Vicini sits motionless. The waves are higher. There are only occasional flashes of moon slanting down between clouds. We'll reach the cliffs by dawn. Inigo Why are you doing that? Making sure nobody's following us. That would be inconceivable. Nailed that. <laughs> yeah. Ten for ten. Sorry, I remember the character a little more now. <laughs> Despite what you think, you will be caught. And when you are, the prince will see you all hanged. Of all the necks on this boat, Highness, the one you should be worrying about is your own. Inigo keeps staring behind them. Stop doing that! We can all relax, it's almost over. You're sure nobody's following us? As I told you, it would be absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable! No one in Gilder knows what we've done, and no one in Florin could have gotten here so fast. Out of curiosity, why do you ask? No reason, it's only, I just happened to look behind us and someone that something is there. What? And suddenly the three whirls stare back, and as they do, cut to, the darkness behind them. It's hard to see, the moon is behind the clouds now, but the wind whistles and the waves pound, and suddenly it's all gone ominous. Cut to Inigo, Fezzik, and Vicini squinting back, trying desperately to see. At this moment, they are all holding their breaths. Cut to the darkness behind them. There's still nothing to be seen. It's still ominous, only now it's eerie too. <laughs> then the moon slips through and Inigo is right. Something is very much there, a sailboat, black, with a great billowing sail. Black. It's a good distance behind them, but it's coming like hell, closing the gap. Cut to Inigo, Fezzik, and Vicini staring at the other boat. Probably some local fishermen out for a pleasure cruise at night through eel-infested waters. And now, as the sound comes from their boat, they turn as we cut to Buttercup, diving into the water, starting to swim away. Cut to the boat and Vicini screaming. 
I don't swim. I only dog paddle. <laughs> left, left, left! Cut to Buttercup, still close to the boat, switching from a crawl to a silent breaststroke, and the wind dies as it does. Something new is heard. A not-too-distant high-pitched shrieking sound. Buttercup stops suddenly, treads water. Cut to the boat. You know what that sound is, Highness? Those are the shrieking eels. If you doubt me, just wait. They always grow louder when they're about to feed on human flesh. Cut to Buttercup, treading water, still not far from the boat. The shrieking sounds are getting louder, more terrifying. Buttercup stays silent. Cut to the boat. If you swim back now, I promise no harm will come to you. I doubt you will get such an offer from the eels. Cut to Buttercup, and she's a gutsy girl. <laughs> the shrieking sound <laughs> louder still, but she doesn't make a sound. Behind her, there is something dark and gigantic that slithers past. She's scared, sure, petrified, who wouldn't be, but she makes no reply. And now a shrieking eel has zeroed in on her. And now she sees it, a short distance, circling, starting to close. And Buttercup is frozen, trying not to make a movement of any kind. And the eel slithers closer, closer. And Buttercup knows it now. There's nothing she can do. It's over, all over. Now the eel opens up his mouth wide. It's never made such a noise. And as its jaws, great jaws are about to clamp down, she doesn't get eaten by the eels at this time. <laughs> the second we hear him cut to sick kid's room, the kid looks the same, pale and weak, but maybe he's gripping the sheets a little too tightly with his hands. What? The eel doesn't get her. I'm explaining to you because you looked uh, nervous. Oh, well, I wasn't nervous. His grandfather says nothing, just waits. Well, maybe I was a little bit concerned, but that's not the same thing. Because I can stop now if you want. No, you can read a little bit more, if you want. He grips the sheets again as the grandfather picks up the book. Do you know what that sound is, Highness? Cut to Vicini. We're back in the boat. Those are the shrieking eels. We're past that, Grandpa. Cut to the kid's room. You read it already. Oh, oh my goodness, I did. I'm, I'm sorry. Beg your pardon. Cut to Buttercup from the water. <laughs> All right, all right, let's see. Uh, she was in the water, the eel was coming after her, she was frightened, the eel started to charge her, and then... And we're back where we were at the last moment we saw her, Buttercup frozen, the shrieking eel jaws wide, about to clamp down as we cut to a giant arm, pounding the eel unconscious in one move, then easily lifting Buttercup, pull back to reveal the boat and Fezzik, Buttercup being deposited on the deck. Put her down, just put her down. Cut to Anigo pointing behind them. I think he's getting closer. Vicini tying Buttercup's hands. He's no concern of ours. Sail on. I suppose you think you're brave, don't you? Only compared to some. Dissolve to the boat at dawn being followed closely by the black sailboat, which we can see for the first time is being sailed by a man in black, and his boat almost seems to be flying. Look, he's right on top of us. I wonder if he's, getting, if he's using the same wind we are using. Whoever he is, he's too late. See? The cliffs of insanity. <laughs> Once he said the name, cut to the cliffs of insanity, Don, they raise str rise straight up, sheer from the water, impossibly high. Cut to the two sailboats in a wild race for the cliffs, and the man in black is closing faster than ever, but not fast enough. The lead was too great to overcome, and as Inigo sails with great precision straight at the cliffs, cut to the boat being pursued. Hurry up! Move the thing! Um, that other thing! Move it! We're safe. Only Fezzik is strong enough to go up our way. He'll have to sail around for hours till he finds a harbor. There's much activity going on, all of it swift, expert, economical. Fezzik reaches up along the cliff face, grabs a jutting rock, reaches behind it. Suddenly, there's a thick rope in his hands. He drops back to the boat, gives the rope a freeing swing, and cut to the cliffs. The rope goes all the way to the top, cut to Inigo. Hurrying to Fezzik, he straps a harness to him, then lifts Buttercup, Buttercup and Bazzini into the harness. Finally, he himself gets into the harness. All three are strapped to Fezzik like papooses. <sighs> <laughs> and he starts to ascend the rope, carrying all of them along with him as he goes. Cut to the man in black, sailing in towards the cliffs of insanity, watching as Fezzik rises swiftly through the first moments of dawn. Cut to the tops of the cliff, looking down. Fezzik's group is only faintly visible far below. This is the first time we've gotten the real vertigo feeling, and it's a gasper. <laughs> Cut to Fezzik climbing on. Buttercup is almost out of her mind with fear. Cut to the entire length of the cliff. Fezzik is moving right along, however high they are. He's already over a third of a way done. 
Cut to the man in black, leaping from his ship to the rope, starting to climb. He's impossibly far behind, but the way he goes, you'd think he didn't know that because he is flying up the rope, hand over hand like lightning. Cut to Vicini and the others. He's climbing down the rope, climbing the rope, and he's gaining on us. Inconceivable! He prods Fezzik, who nods, increases his pace. Cut to the man in black, roaring up the rope, and cut to long shot, the cliffs. The man in black is cutting deeply into Fezzik's lead. Cut to Vicini and the others. Faster! I thought I was going faster. You were supposed to be this colossus. You were this great legendary thing, and yet he gains. Well, I'm carrying three people, and he's got only himself. I don't accept excuses. I'm just going to have to find myself a new giant. That's all. Don't say that. Vizzini, please. (laughs) His arms begin moving much more slowly. Cut to the man in black. His arms still work as before. If anything, he has speeded up. Fezzik's lead is smaller and smaller. Cut to view from the top of the cliffs. Maybe 100 feet for Fezzik to go. Maybe more. Cut to Vizzini and the others, and it's getting too close now. Did I make it clear that your job is at stake? Cut to a man in black, less than 100 feet below him and gaining. Cut to the cliff top as Fezzik makes it. Vizzini leaps off and takes out the knife, begins to cut the rope, which is tied around a great rock, while Inigo helps the princess to her feet, and Fezzik just stands around, waiting for someone to tell him to do something. Nearby are some stone ruins. Once they might have been a fort, now the kind of resemble Stonehenge. Cut to the men in black, man in black, feet from the top now, maybe less, maybe only 50, and his pace is dazzling as before. And cut to Vicini, cutting through the last of the rope, and cut to the rope, slithering across the ground and out of sight towards the channel, like some great serpent at his at last going home. Cut to Fezzik, standing with Inigo and Buttercup at the cliff edge. He has very good arms. Cut to the man in black, hanging suspended hundreds of feet in the air, holding to the jagged rocks, desperately trying to cling to life. Cut to Vicini, stunned, turning to the others, looking down. He didn't fall? Inconceivable! You keep using that word. I do not think you, I do not think it means what you think it means. My God, he's climbing. Cut to the man in black. And so he is, very slowly, he is picking his way upwards, sometimes a foot at a time, sometimes an inch. Cut to the group at the top, staring down. Whoever he is, he's obviously seen us with the princess and therefore must die. You, carry her. We'll head straight for the Gilder frontier. Catch up when he's dead. If he falls, fine. If not, the sword. Nigo nods. I want to duel him left-handed. You know what a hurry we're in. Well, it's the only way I can be satisfied. If I use my right hand, over too quickly. Oh, have it your way. Cut to the man in black, still creeping his way up, upward. Cut to Fezzik, who goes to Inigo. You be careful. People in masks cannot be trusted. I'm waiting! Fez nods, hurries after Vicini. Cut to Inigo. He watches them depart, then turns, peers down over the cliffs. He watches a moment, then paces, shaking his hands loose. He, he practices a few of his own fencing skills. He is taut and nervous fellow, and has never been one for waiting around. Cut to the man in black, climbing on. He must be six inches closer to the top than when we last saw him. Inigo is watching. Cut to Inigo, walking faster. Finally, he goes back to the cliff edge, starts to talk. It's instant death if the man man in black falls, but neither gives that possibility much credence. This This is our two heroes meeting. They don't know it yet, but that's what it is. Hello there. Man in black glances up, kind of grunts. Slow going. Look, I don't mean to be rude, but this is not as easy as it looks, so I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't distract me. Sorry. Thank you. Nigo steps away, draws his sword, loosens up with a few perfect thrusts, then resheathes it and looks eagerly over the edge again. I do not suppose you could speed things up. If you're in such a hurry, you could lower a rope or a tree branch or find something useful to do. I could do that. In fact, I've got some rope up here, but I do not think that you will accept my help since I am only waiting around to kill you. That does put a damper on our relationship. He finds another hold a few inches higher. But I promise you I will not kill you until you reach the top. That's very comforting, but I'm afraid you'll just have to wait. I hate waiting. I could give you my word as a Spaniard. No good, I've known too many Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Mm. And he just hangs there in space, resting, gathering his strength. 
You don't know any way you'll trust me? Nothing comes to mind. And on these words, camera zooms into a close-up on an ego. He, races, he raises his right hand high, his eyes blaze, and his voice takes on a tone we have not yet heard. I swear on the soul of my father, Domingo Montoya, you will reach the top alive. Cut to the man in black. There is a pause, then quietly. Throw me the rope. <laughs> yeah. Cut to Inigo. He dashes to the giant rock the rope was originally tied to. Cut to the man in black. As his group grip loosens a moment, trying to cling to the side of the cliff, cut to Inigo now with a small coil of rope, hurries back to the edge and hurls it over. Cut to the rope. It hangs close to the man in black. He releases the rocks, grabs the rope, hangs helplessly in space a moment, then looks up at Inigo and cut to Inigo, straining, forcing his body away from the cliff and cut to the man in black. Rising through the early morning light, slowly, steadily, and as the cliff top at last comes within reach, cut to an ego, watching as the man in black crawls to safety, safety, then looks to an ego, pulling his sword. Thank you. We'll wait until you're ready, ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll wait until you're ready. <laughs> Again, thank you. The man in black sits to rest on the boulder that once held the rope. He tugs off his leather boots and it's amazed to see and is amazed to see several large rocks tumble out. The man in black wears gloves and ego stares at them. Huh. I do not mean to pry, but you don't by any chance happen to have six fingers on your right hand. He glances up. The question clearly baffles him. Do you always begin conversations this way? Well, my father was slaughtered by a six fingered man. He was a great sword maker, my father. And when the six-fingered man appeared and requested my, a special sword, my father took the job. He slaved a year before he was done. He hands his sword to the man in black. I've never seen its equal. Close up on Inigo. Even now, this still brings pain. The six-fingered man returned and demanded it, but at one-tenth his pro promised price. My father refused. Without a word, the six-fingered man slashed him through the heart. I love my father, so naturally challenged his murderer to a duel. I failed. The six-fingered man did leave me alive with the six-fingered sword, but he gave me these. Touches his scars, cut to the man in black looking up at Inigo. How old were you? I was 11 years old. When I was strong enough, I dedicated my li life to the study of fencing. So the next time we meet, I will not fail. I will go up to the six-fingered man and say, hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. You've done nothing but study swordplay? More pursuit than study lately. You see, I cannot find him. It's been 20 years now. I'm starting to lose confidence. I just work for Vizzini to pay the bills. There's not a lot of money in revenge. Well, I certainly hope you find him someday. <clears throat> you are ready then. Whether I am or not, you've been more than fair. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. <laughs> You seem a decent fellow. I hate to see, I hate to die. Begin! And on that word, cut to the two of them. And what we are starting now is one of the great, two greatest sword fights in modern movies. The other one happens later on. <laughs> wow. Getting that it's different. Because they aren't close to each other, none of the sword crossings on guard, nor, none of the sword crossings <laughs> on guard garbage. No, what we have here is two men, two athletes, and they look to be far away to damage each other. But each time one makes even the tiniest feint, the other counters, and there is silence. And as they start to circle, cut to the six-fingered sword, fainting here, fainting there, and cut to the two men, finished teasing, begin to duel in earnest. Their swords cross, then again, again, and the sound comes so fast it's almost continual. And Ego pr presses on, the man in black retreating up a rocky incline. You're using Bonetti's defense against me, huh? I thought it fitting, considering the rocky terrain. Naturally, you must expect me to attack with couple fiddle. And he shifts his style now. Naturally. But I find <laughs> Thibaut can't <laughs> grab Capo Ferro, don't you? The man in black is now perched at the edge of the elevated castle run. Nowhere to go. He jumps to the sand and Ego stares down at him. Unless the enemy has studied his Agrippa. <laughs> and now with the chance, with the grace of an Olympian, an Ego flies off the perch, somersaults clean over the man in black's head and lands facing his opponent. Which I have done. <laughs> the two men are almost flying across the rocky terrain, never losing balance, never clo coming close to the stumbling. The battle rages with incredible finesse. 
first one and then the other gaining the advantage. And by now it's clear that this isn't just two athletes going at it. It's a lot more than that. This is two legendary swashbucklers and they're in their prime. It's Burt Lancaster and the Crimson Pirate battling Errol Flynn and Robin Hood. Wow. And then incredibly, the action begins going even faster than before as we cut to Inigo. And behind him now, drawing closer all the time is the deadly edge of the cliffs of insanity. Inigo fights and ducks and faints and slashes and it all works, but not for long as gradually the man in black keeps the advantage, keeps forcing Inigo back closer and closer to death. You are wonderful. Thank you. I've worked hard to become so. Cliff Edge is very close now, and Ego is continually being forced against it. I admit it. You are better than I am. Then why are you smiling? Inches from defeat, and Ego is, in fact, all smiles. Because I know something you don't know. And what is that? I'm not left-handed. And he throws the six-handed sword into his right hand, and immediately the tide of battle turns. Whoa. Cut to... Oh. The man in black, stunned, doing everything he can to keep Inigo by the cliff edge, but no use. Slowly at first, he begins to retreat. Now faster, Inigo is in control and the man in black is desperate. Cut to Inigo, and the six-figured sword is all but invisible now as he increases his attack and suddenly switches styles again. Cut to a rocky staircase leading to the turret-shaped plateau. And the man in black is retreating like mad up the steps and he can't stop Inigo. Nothing can stop Inigo. And in a frenzy, the man in black makes every feint, tries every thrust, lets go with all he has left, but he fails, everything fails. He tries one or two final desperate moves, but they are nothing. You're amazing. I ought to be after 20 years. Now the man in black is smashed into a stone pillar pinned there under the six-fingered sword. There's something I ought to tell you. Tell me. I am not left-handed either. Now he changes hands oh. last the battle is fully joined. <laughs> Cut to Inigo, and to his amazement, he's being forced back down the steps. He tries one style, another, but it all comes down to the same thing. The man in black seems to be in control. And before Inigo knows it, the six-fingered sword is knocked clear of his hand, out of his hand. Inigo retreats, dives away from the stairs to the moss-covered bar, suspended over the archway. He swings out, lands, and scrambles to his sword, and we cut to the man in black, who watches Inigo, then casually tosses his sword to the landing where it sticks in perfectly. Then the man in black copies an ego, not copies exactly, improves. He dives to the bar, swings completely over it like a circus performer and dismounts with a backflip. Cut to an ego staring in awe. Who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to an ego, moving like lightning. And he thrusts forward, slashes, darts back all in almost a single movement and cut to the man in black dodging, blocking, and again he thrusts forward faster than ever before. And again he slashes, but cut to Inigo. And there is never a move anyone makes he doesn't remember. And this time he blocks the slash, slashes out himself with the six-fingered sword. And on it goes, back and forth across the rocky terrain, Inigo's feet moving with the grace and speed of a great improvisational dancer cut to the six-fingered sword as it is knocked free, arching up into the air, and cut to Inigo, catching it again. And something terrible is written behind his eyes. He has given his all, done everything a man can do, tried every style, made every maneuver, and it wasn't enough. And on his face, for all to see, is the realization that he, Inigo Montoya of Spain, is going to lose. Cut to the man in black, moving in for the end now, blocking everything, muzzling everything, and cut to the six-fingered sword sent flying from an ego's grip. He stands helplessly only a moment, then he drops to his knees, bows his head, shuts his eyes. Kill me quickly. I would as soon destroy a stained glass window as an artist like yourself. However, since I can't have you following me either. And he ducks Inigo's head, ducks, dunks Inigo's head with a heavy sword handle. Inigo pitches oh, for oh. Please understand, <laughs> I hold you in the highest respect. He grabs his scabbard and takes off after the princess, and we cut to a close-up to Sini. Inconceivable! <laughs> Pull back to reveal Vicini staring down from a narrow mountain path, mountain path, as far below the man in black can be seen running. Fezzik carrying the princess stands outside. <coughs> it's a little later in the morning. Give her to me. Catch up with us quickly. What do I do? Finish him, finish him, your way. Oh, good. My way. Thank you, Vizini. Which way is my way? 
cut to a couple of rocks, nothing gigantic. Vicini points to it, to them. There is a large boulder nearby. Pick up one of these rocks, get behind the boulder, and in a few minutes, the man in black will come running around the bend. The minute his head is in view, hit it with a rock. As Vicini and Becca hurry away. My way is not very sportsmanlike. <laughs> grabs one of the rocks and plods behind the boulder and we dissolve to the man in black racing up the mountain trail ahead is abandoned the trail he sees it slows then he stops listening satisfied by the silence he starts forward again and as he rounds the bend a rock flies into frame shattering on the boulder inches in front of him cut to Fezzik he moves into the mountain path he has picked up another rock and holds it lightly I did that on purpose I don't have to miss I leave you. So what happens now? We face each other as God intended. Sportsmanlike. No tricks, no weapons. Skills against skill alone. You mean you'll put down your rock and I'll put down my sword and we'll try to kill each other like civilized people? I could kill you now. <laughs> but the man in black shakes his head, takes off his sword and scabbard, begins the approach toward the giant. Frankly, I think the odds are slightly in your favor at hand fighting. It's not my fault being the biggest and the strongest. I don't even exercise. Yeah. Cut to the mountain path and the two men. The man in black is not now and has never been a shrimp. <laughs> but it's like he wasn't from there. Fezzik towers over him so much. There is a moment's pause and the man in black dives at Fezzik's chest, slams him several tremendous blows in the stomach, twists his arm severely, slips skillfully into a beautifully applied bear hug, and in, ge in general makes a number of terrific wrestling moves. Fezzik just stands there, kind of taking in the scenery. Finally, the man in black, black pushes himself away, stares up at the giant. Look, are you just fiddling around with me or what? I just want you to feel you're doing well. I hate for people to die embarrassed. <laughs> they get set to begin again then suddenly cut to Fezzik as he jumps forward with stunning speed for anyone his side at size and reaches for the man in black who drops to his knees spins loose and slips between the giant's legs you're quick and a good thing too why do you wear a mask were you burned by acid or something like that mm. oh no it's just that they're terribly comfortable I think everyone will be them in the future Whoa! There's this a moment. And <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah. This movie was telling the future. Wild. <laughs> Fezzik considers this a moment and then attacks. And if he moved quickly last time, this time he is blinding. And as the man in black slips down to avoid the charge, Fezzik moves right with him, only instead of twisting free and jumping to his feet. This time the man in black jumps for Fezzik's back. And in a moment he is riding him. And his arms have Fezzik's throat locked across Fezzik's windpipe. One in front, one behind. The man in black begins to squeeze tighter. I just figured out why you give me so much trouble. Cut to Fezzik as he charges towards a huge rock that lines the path. And just as he reaches it, he spins his giant body so that the entire weight of the charge is taken by the man in black. Cut to the man in black. The power of the charge is terrible, the pain enormous, but he clings to the grip at Fezzik's windpipe. Why is that, do you think? Well, I just haven't fought just one person for so long. I've been specializing in groups, battling gangs for local charities, that kind of thing. Cut to another huge rock on the other side of the path. Again, Fezzik charges, slower this time, but still a charge. And again, he spins and creams the man in black against the rough boulder. Cut to the man in black, and the punishment is terrible. For a moment, it seems as if he is going to let go of Fezzik's windpipe and crumble, but he doesn't, he holds on. Why should that make such a difference? Well, you see, you use different moves when you're fighting half a dozen people than when you only have to be worried about one. Again, Fezzik slams the man in black against the boulder, only this time his powers diminish, and Fezzik starts to slowly collapse. Cut to Fezzik, and there isn't much breath coming. Cut to the man in black, holding his grip as Fezzik tries to stand. Halfway makes it, but there's no air. Back to his knees he falls, holds there for a moment, and pitches down to all full. Fours. The man in black increases the pressure. Fezzik tries to crawl, but there is just no air. No air. Fezzik goes to the earth and lies still. Cut to Fezzik. As the man in black turns him over, puts his ear to Fezzik's heart, it beats. The man in black stands. I don't envy, uh, I don't envy you the headache you will have when you awake. But in the meantime, rest well and dream of large women. 
he nimbly scoops up his sword with his foot, catches it as he dashes off up a along the mountain path. Cut to Prince Humperdinck as he slips his boots into a footprint in the sand. Count Rugen, mounted, watches. Behind him, half a dozen armed warriors. Also mounted, a great white horse awaits riderless in front. Humperdinck is all over the rocky ground, and maybe he isn't the best hunter in the world. Then again, maybe he is. Because as he begins to put his foot into the strange positions, we realize that what he is doing is mining the fencers. That was a mighty duel. It ranged all over. They were both masters. Who won? How did it end? The loser ran off alone. The winner followed those footprints towards Gilda. Shall we track them both? Uh, the loser is nothing. Only the princess matters. Clearly, this was all planned by warriors of Gilda. We must be ready for whatever lies ahead. Could this be a trap? I always think everything could be a trap. Which is why I'm still alive. Uh. <laughs> Cut to the man in black, cresting the peak of the mountain. Cut to close-up on, a knife pointed at a throat. Pull back to reveal Bassini munching on an apple, holding the knife to Buttercup's throat. She is blindfolded. A picnic spread is laid out. Table cloth, two goblets, and between them, a small leather wine container. Some cheese and a couple of apples. The picnic is set on a lovely spot high on the edge of a mountain path with a view all the way back to the sea. The man in black comes running around the path. He's just <laughs> close. The two men study each other. So it is down to you, and it is down to me. The man in black nods and comes nearer. If you wish her dead, by all means, keep moving forward. And he pushes his long knife harder against Buttercup's unprotected throat. Let me explain. There's nothing to explain. You're trying to kidnap what I've rightfully stolen. Perhaps an arrangement can be reached. There will be no arrangement, and you're killing her. Cut to Buttercup's throat. As Vecini jabs with a long neck, Buttercup gasps against the pain. Cut to the man in black, stopping fast. But if there can be no arrangement, then we are at an impasse. I'm afraid so. I can't compete with you physically, and you're no match for my brains. You're that smart? Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes. Morons. Really? In that case, I challenge you to a battle of wits. For the princess? The man in black nods. To the death. Another nod. I accept. <laughs> Good. Then pour the wine. As Vasini fills the goblets with the dark red liquid, the man in black pulls a small packet from his clothing, handing it to Vasini. Inhale this, but do not touch. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadlier poisons known to man. Hmm. Cut to Bassini, watching excitedly as the man in black takes the goblets, turns his back. A moment later, he turns again, faces Bassini, drops the iocane packet. It is now empty. The man in black rotates the goblets in a little shell game maneuver, then puts one glass in front of Bassini, the other in front of himself. All right, where is the poison? The battle of wits has begun. It ends when you decide and we both drink and find out who is right and who is dead. But it's so simple. All I have to do is divine from what I know of you. Are, are you the sort of man who would put the poison into his own goblet or his enemies? He studies the man in black now. Now, a clever man would put the poison into his own goblet because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. Now, I'm not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you, but you must have known I was not a great fool. You would have counted on it, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You've made your decision then? Not remotely. Because Iocane comes from Australia, as everyone knows, and Australia is entirely peopled with criminals and people not and and criminals are used to having people not trust them as you are not trusted by me so i can clearly not choose the wine in front of you truly you have a dizzying in intellect wait till i get going where was i <laughs> australia yes australia and you must have suspected that i would have known the powder's origin so i can clearly not choose the wine in front of me you're just stalling now you would like to think that wouldn't you You've beaten my giant 
which means you're exceptionally strong. So you could have put the poison in your own goblet, trusting on your strength to save you. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you've also bested my Spaniard, which means you must have studied. And in studying, you must have learned that man is mortal. And so you would have put the poison as far from yourself as possible. So I clearly cannot choose the wine in front of me. This is <laughs> insane. pleasure has been growing throughout. The man in black has been fast disappearing. You're trying to trick me into giving away something. It won't work. It has worked. You've given everything away. I know where the poison is. Then make your choice. I will. And I choose. And suddenly he stops, point at something behind the man in black. What in the world can that be? The man in black turning around, looking. What? Where? I don't see anything. Cut to Vassini, busily sl- switching the goblets while the man in black has his head turned. Oh, well, I, I, I could have sworn I saw something. No matter. The man in black turns to face him again. Vassini starts to laugh. <laughs> What's so funny? I'll tell you in a minute. First, let's drink. Me from my glass and you from yours. He picks up his goblet. The man in black picks up the one in front of him. As they both start to drink, Vicini hesitates a moment. Then, allowing the man in black to drink first, he swallows his wine. You guessed wrong. Uh, You only think I guessed wrong. That's what's so funny. I switched glasses when your back was turned, you fool. Cut to the man in black. There's nothing he can say. He just sits there. Cut to Vicini, watching him. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less well known is this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. He laughs and roars and cackles and whoops and is in all whoop, way cheery until he falls. Whoop, whoop, whoop. That's the man in black. <laughs> Stepping past the corpse. Taking the blindfold and bindings off Buttercup, who notices Vicini lying dead. The man in black pulls her to her feet. Who are you? I'm no one to be trifled with. That is all you ever need to know. He starts to lead her off the mountain path into untraveled terrain. To think, all that time it was your cup that was poisoned. They were both poisoned. I spent the last few years building up an immunity to Iocane powder. And with that, he takes off, dragging her behind him. Cut to a mountain path. It's where Fezzik fought the man in black. Camera pulls back to reveal the prince, kneeling, inspecting every grain of misplaced sand. The others wait behind him. Someone has beaten a giant. (laughs) There'll be great suffering in Gilda if she dies. (laughs) He leaps onto his horse and they charge off. Cut to a wild stretch of terrain. The man in black comes running into view, still dragging Buttercup, who sometimes stumbles, but he keeps forcing her along. Finally, when she is close to exhaustion, he lets go of her. Catch your breath. If you release me, whatever you ask for ransom, you'll get it, I promise you. And what is that worth, the promise of a woman? You're very funny, Highness. I was giving you a chance. No matter where you take me, there's no greater hunter than Prince Humperdinck. He could track a falcon on a cloudy day. He can find you. You think your dearest love will save you? I never said he was my dearest love, and yes, He will save me, that I know. You admit to me that you do not love your fiance. He knows I do not love him. Are not capable of love is what you mean. I have loved more deeply than a killer like yourself could ever dream. The man in black cocks cocks back a fist. Buttercup, Buttercup flinches but does not retreat. That was a warning, Highness. The next time my hand flies on its own. For where I come from, there are penalties when a woman lies. Whoa. This is his body. The picnic is before. Camera pulls back to reveal the prince kneeling by the body as the others ride up. The prince grabs the empty poison packet, hands it to Rugen after first sniffing it himself. Hiya, Kane. I'd bet my life on it. And there are the princess's footprints. She's alive, or was, an hour ago. If she is otherwise, when I find her, I shall be very put out. And as he vaults onto his horse and all of that and they all charge off, cut to Buttercup, being spun into camera view, falling heavily as the man in black releases her. We're at the edge of an almost sheer ravine. The drop is sharp and severe. Below, the ravine floor is flat, but getting there will not be half the fun. Rest, Heinz. I know who you are. Your cruelty reveals everything. The man in black says nothing. You're the dread pirate Roberts, admit it. With pride. What can I do for you? You can die slowly, cut into a thousand pieces. Hardly complimentary, your highness. Why loose your venom on me? Close up, Buttercup. Quietly now. 
You killed my love. <laughs> That's the man in black watching her closely. It's possible. I kill a lot of people. Who was this love of yours? Another prince like this one? Ugly, rich, and scabby? No, a farm boy. Poor. Poor and perfect, with eyes like the sea after a storm. Buttercup. And probably, if she did not hate Roberts now, there would be tears. On the high seas, your ship attacked, and the dread pirate Roberts never takes prisoners. I can't afford to make exceptions. Once word leaks out that a pirate has gone soft, people begin to disobey you, and then it's nothing but work, work, work all the time. You mock my pain. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. I remember this farm boy of yours, I think. This would be, what, five years ago? Buttercup nods. Does it bother you to hear? Nothing you can say will upset me. He died well. That should please you. No bribe attempts or blubbering. He simply said, please, please, I need to live. It's the please that caught my memory. I asked him what was so important for him. True love, he replied, and then he spoke of a girl of surpassing beauty and faithfulness. I can only assume he meant you. Bless me for destroying him before he found out what you really are. And what am I? Faithfulness you talked of, madam. Your enduring faithfulness. Now tell me truly, when you found out he was gone, did you get engaged to your prince that same hour, or did you wait a whole week out of respect for the dead? You mocked me once. Never do it again. I died that day. The man in black is about to reply as they stand there on the edge of the sheer ravine. But then something catches his attention, and he stares at it briefly. Cut to his POV, the dust cloud caused by Humperdinck's horses is riding up into the sky, cut to Buttercup. And while he, his attention is on the dust cloud, rising high, she pushes him with all the strength she has. You can die too for all I care. The man in black, teetering on the ravine edge for a moment, then he begins to fall. Down goes the man in black. Down, down, rolling, spinning, crashing. Uh, crashing always down towards the flat rock floor of the ravine. Cut to Buttercup staring transfixed at what she wrought. There is a long pause. She stands there alone, as far from below the words come to her, drifting on the wind. As you wish. <gasps> oh, my sweet Wesley, what have I done? And without a second thought or consideration of the dangers, she starts into the ravine. A moment later, she too is falling, spinning, twisting, crashing and torn, cartwheeling down towards what is left of her beloved. Cut to the dust cloud rising, pull back to reveal Prince Humperdinck and the others reining in at the spot where Buttercup promised ransom in exchange for her freedom. Prince shakes his head. Disappeared. He must have seen us closing in, which might account for his panicking and error. Unless I'm wrong, and I'm never wrong, they're headed dead into the fire swamp. Cut to Count Rubin. The mere mention of the fire swamp makes him pale. Cut to the ravine floor. Two bodies lie at the a few feet apart, not moving. It is, of course, Buttercup and Wesley. It might be corpses. After a time, Wesley slowly forces his body into motion, as, and as he does, we cut to Buttercup, bruised and torn, as Wesley crawls slowly towards her. Can you move at all? Move? You're alive. If you want, I can fly. I told you, I would always come for you. Why didn't you wait for me? Well, you were dead. <laughs> Death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. I will never doubt again. There will never be a need. And now they begin to kiss. It's a tender kiss, tender and loving and gentle, and... Oh, no! No! Cut <laughs> <laughs> to the kid's bedroom. What is it? What's the matter? They're kissing again. Do we have to hear the kissing part? Someday you may not mind so much. Skip onto the fire swamp. That sounded good. Oh, you're sick. I'll humor you. So, now where were we? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Wesley and Buttercup raced along the ravine floor. Tim, that is a spot-on impression. Yeah. <laughs> really I'm so right. impressed. Uh, and your Andre. Yeah. Yeah, I man. Had, I, had, I had no idea that my Peter Falk was this strong. I <laughs> this, is, this is a character for you. Wow. <laughs> Very You've obviously seen it enough to get the enunciation of all of his lines, too. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I've seen this movie three times. I don't know how it's so fun. <laughs> yeah. Cut to Wesley and Buttercup racing along the ravine floor. Wesley glances up. Cut to Humperdinck and his men perched on top of the cliff, looking down at Wesley and Buttercup. Cut to Wesley. 
Ha! Your pig fiancé is too late. A few more steps and we'll be safe in the fire swamp. Cut to Buttercup, and Wesley has tried to say it with cavalier-like nonchalance, but she ain't buying. We'll never survive. Nonsense. You're only saying that because no one ever has. As they race off, leaving Humperdinck and his men stranded, uh, and his men stranded, defeated. Cut to the fire swamp. And it really doesn't look any worse than any other moist, sulfurous, infernal horror that you might run across. Great trees off the sun. Cut to Wesley and Buttercup. Buttercup is clearly panicked, and maybe Wesley is too, but he moves jauntily along, sword in hand. It's not that bad. I'm not saying I'd like to build a summer home here, but the trees are actually quite lovely. The giant trees, thick and black green, look ominous as hell, and they shield all of the intermittent stripes of sun. A giant spurt of flame leaps up, preceded by a slight popping sound, and this particular spurt of flame misses Wesley, but Buttercup is suddenly on fire, at least the lower half of her is, and <laughs> to Wesley, instant, instantly forcing Buttercup to sit, gathering her flaming hem in his hands, doing his best to suffocate the fire. This isn't all that easy, and it causes him a bit of grief, but he does his best to sound as jaunty as before. Well now, that was an adventure. He examined where the flames burst over her. Singed a bit, were you? You? He was, and he shakes his head no. As he pulls her to her feet, cut to the slump swamp floor and there's another popping sound cut to wesley grabbing buttercup pulling her aside to safety as another great spur spun of flame suddenly shoots shoots up well one thing i will say the fire swamp certainly does keep you on your toes buttercup is frozen with fear he takes her hand gently leads her forward as we cut to the two of them moving slowly along through a particularly dangerous part of the fire swamp it's later now. The sun slants down at a slightly different angle. This will all soon be but a happy memory because Robert's ship Revenge is anchored at the far end. And I, as you know, am Robert's. But how is that possible since he's been marauding 20 years and you only left me five years ago? I myself am often surprised at life's little quirks. There's again a popping sound, then a huge spurt of flame. Wesley simply picks up Buttercup as they walk along, moves her out of danger, puts her back down again, goes right on talking without missing a beat. You see, what I told you before about saying please was true. It intrigued Roberts, as did my descriptions of your beauty. Cut to some hideous vines. They look like they could be flesh eating. Wesley takes his sword, slices a path for them to follow. The vines groan as they fall. He's been chatting away the entire time. Finally, Roberts decided something. He said, all right, Wesley, I've never had a valet. You can try it for tonight. I'll most certainly, I'll, mo I'll most likely kill you in the morning. Three years, he said that. Good night, Wesley. Good work. Sleep well. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. It was a fine time for me. I was learning to fence, to fight, anything anyone would teach me. And Roberts and I eventually became friends. And then it happened. What? Go on. Wesley picks her up, carrying her across some swamp water that is bridged by a narrow, rickety tree branch. Well, Roberts had grown so rich, he wanted to retire. So he took me to his cabin and told me his secret. I am not the dread pirate Roberts, he said. My name is Ryan. I inherited this ship from the previous Dread Pirate, Roberts. You will inherit it from me. The man I inherited it from was not the real Dread Pirate, Roberts, either. His name was Cummerbund. The real Roberts has been retired 15 years and living like a king in Patagonia. Then he explained this name was important. Then, then he explained the name was the important thing for inspiring the necessary fear. You see, no one would surrender to the Dread Pirate, Wesley. The two of them have, have by now crossed the pond. So we sailed ashore, took on an entirely new crew, and he stayed aboard for a while as first mate, all the time calling me Roberts. Once the crew believed, he left the ship, and I have been Roberts ever since. Except now that we're together, I shall retire and hand the name over to someone else. Is everything clear to you? Buttercup, perplexed, is about to reply, but the ground she steps on gives way. It's lightning sand, a great ah. pain of it. And it has her, a cloud of powder rises, and she sinks into the stuff, crying Wesley's name. But then she's gone as we cut to Wesley whirling, slashing at a U-shaped vine, hacks it in half. It's still connected to the tree and he grabs it, drops his sword and clutching the other end of the vine, he di dives into the lightning sand and there is another cloud of white powder, but it settles quickly. Now nothing can be seen, nothing at all, just the lightning sand, lovely and lethal. Holding on the lightning sand, then an odd panting sound is heard now. The pant panting sound is suddenly very loud, and then a giant R-O-U-S darts into the darts into view. 
the ROUS, a rodent of unusual size, is probably no more than 80 pounds of bone and power. It sniffs around a bit then. As quickly as it has come, it goes. Cut to the lightning sand. As Wesley, lungs long past the bursting point, explodes out, he has Buttercup across his shoulders. And as he pulls to the edge of the lightning sand pit using the vine, cut to a close up of Buttercup. Her face is caked with the white powder. It is in her eyes, her ears, hair, mouth. She is prob still probably beautiful, <laughs> but you have to look <laughs> up. As Wesley continues to pull them to safety, cut to the ROUS high above him, it watches. Cut the buttercup, placed against a tree. Wesley is uh, the lightning sand from her face. He hesitates, glances around, and cut to the ROUS. On a much lower branch now, it stares down at Wesley. Wesley stares back up at the beast. Buttercup is oblivious. Her eyes flutter. He continues to work on her as. We'll never succeed. We may as well die here. No. No. We have already succeeded. He glances back again. Now there are two ROUSs. Um, they have climbed into a nearby tree, stare down, hu stare hungrily down, cut to Wesley picking her up. He puts an arm around her, starts to walk with her as he encouragingly goes on talking. I mean, what are the three terrors of the fire swamp? One, the flame spurts, no problem. There's a popping sound preceding each, so we can avoid that. Two, the lightning sand, but you were clever enough to discover what that looks like, so in the future we can avoid that too. Wesley, what about the ROUSs? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. And as he says that, an ROUS comes flying at him from off screen, cut <laughs> from screaming, and Wesley <laughs> under the attacking ROUS, trying to fend it off, can't. The thing's teeth sink deep into his arm. He howls. <laughs> Wesley his <laughs> face, rolling off of it, rolling it off. He reaches for his sword just a few feet away. But the ROUS is back atop him. It's a fierce battle. And just when we think Wesley can't possibly win, he flips the ugly rodent clear. Wesley scrabbles for his sword. The ROUS stampedes on, chaining its target, heading right for Buttercup. And she's scared to death and... Wesley! Wesley abandons his sword, reaching for the rodent, grabbing only a tail, wrestling with it. Buttercup grabs a small branch and using it as a club, beats the skull of the thing, doing pretty well. But the beast manages to snag her hand with its razor teeth, and she's pulled to the ground and cut to Wesley, jumping onto its back. And the ROUS is all over him now, sinking needle teeth into Wesley's shoulder. Cut to Wesley, with death close at hand. As a popping sound starts, he tries one desperate move, rolls into the sound, and cut to a flame spurt, shooting skyward. And Wesley, with the ROUS pinned under him, and as the beast bursts into flame, it lets go and Wesley rolls safely free, grabs his sword, and exhaustedly stabs the ROUS, which is trying to put itself out. The ROUS collapses dead. Wesley stands, mo stands motionless, exhausted. The danger has passed. Cut to Buttercup, relieved. Wow. He walks to the far edge of the fire swamp, beyond a beach. Cut to Buttercup and Wesley. We did it. Now, oh, was that so terrible? <sighs> And from somewhere they summon strength, pick up their pace, and as they reach the edge of the fire swamp, cut to something we hadn't expected. Humperdinck on his horse, Rugen beside him, three warriors, armed and ready, are mounted in formation behind. Buttercup and Wesley are at the edge of the fire swamp. About to leave it, they stop. Buttercup looks beyond exhaustion. Wesley looks worse. Surrender. Probably. <laughs> it's dusk. Behind Humperdinck are the waters of the bay. Cut to Wesley and Buttercup staring out at the others. You mean you wish to surrender to me? Very well, I accept. I give you full marks for bravery. Don't make yourself a fool. Ah, but how will you capture us? We know the secrets of the fire swamp. We can live there quite happily for some time. So whenever you feel like dying, feel free to visit. I tell you once again, surrender. It will not happen. Cut to Buttercup, looking from one to the other. Then something else catches her eye, and we cut to an armed warrior in shadow with a loaded crossbow aimed at Wesley's heart. Cut to Buttercup, looking the other way. Cut to another warrior, a crossbow aimed at Wesley. For the last time, surrender! Death first! Cut to Buttercup, frantically staring around, and now cut to a third warrior, a crossbow stretched, ready to shoot. This one is hidden in the tree, blocking any escape Wesley might try. Will you promise not to hurt him? Cut to Humperdinck, whirling to face her. What was that? Cut to Wesley, whirling to face her. 
What was that? Uh, <laughs> Buttercup talking to both of them. If we surrender and I return with you, will you promise not to hurt this man? May I live a thousand years and never hunt again. He is a sailor on the pirate ship Revenge. Promise to return him to his ship. I swear it will be done. Cut to Buttercup and Wesley staring deep into each other's eyes. Cut to Humperdinck and Reuben. Reuben. Once we're out of sight, take him back to Florida and throw him in the pit of despair. I swear it will be done. <laughs> Cut to Buttercup and Wesley. I thought you were dead once and it almost destroyed me. I could not bear it if you died again. Not when I could save you. Wesley is dazed, silent. Buttercup tries to speak again, can't, and is swooped off her feet on the company horse. And as they go off, cut to Wesley, staring after her. Rugen watches as his warriors bring Wesley to him. The Count has a heavy sword, and he, hold, and he holds it in his hand. Come, sir. We must get you to your ship. We are men of action. Lies do not become us. Well spoken, sir. Wesley's looking at him. What is it? You have six fingers on your right hand. Someone was looking for you. Count Rugen clubs Wesley hard across the skull. Wesley starts to fall. The screen goes black. Fade in on the pit of despair, dank and chill, underground and windowless, lit by flickering torches, frightening. Wesley lies in the center of the cage, chained and helpless, something really frightening. A bloodless looking albino. <laughs> Dead pale, he silently enters the room, carrying a tray of food and medication. He puts it down. Where am I? The pit of despair. He begins sending Wesley's wound. Wesley winces. Don't even think... <coughs> Don't even think about trying to escape. The chains are far too thick. And don't dream of being rescued, either. The only way is secret. And only the prince and count and I know how to get in and out. Then I'm here till I die? Till they kill you, yeah. <laughs> then why bother curing me? The prince and the count have always insisted on, always insist on everyone being healthy before they're broken. So it's to be torture. The albino nods. I can cope with torture. The albino shakes his head. You don't believe me? You survived the fire swamp. You must be very brave. But nobody withstands the machine. He studies Wesley, whose face is almost sad. Cut to Buttercup, and her face is sad, pallid, perhaps <laughs> ill. She wanders down a corridor in Florin Castle as she moves unseen past an intersecting corridor. Cut to Prince Humperdinck and Count Rugen watching her. She's been like that ever since the fire swamp. It's my father's failing health that's upsetting her. Of course. Mm. As they move on, cut to Florin Castle at night. The camera holds on it while we hear the grandfather's voice reading. The king died that very night, and before the following dawn, Buttercup and Humperdinck were married. Cut to the main square at Florin Castle, and if we thought it was packed before, we didn't know how many more could fit in this courtyard. Humperdinck, Rugen, and the queen stand high on the balcony. And at noon, she met her subjects again this time as their queen. My father's final words were... Hold it, hold it, Grandpa. The scene freezes, Humperdinck caught in mid-sentence. Cut to the kid's room. The kid is half sitting now. Not strong yet, but clearly stronger than when we first saw him. You read that wrong. She doesn't marry Humperdinck, she marries Wesley. I'm just sure of it. After all the Wesley did for her, if she does not marry him, it wouldn't be fair. Well, who says life is fair? Where is that written? Life isn't always fair. I'm telling you, you're messing up the story. Now get it right. Do you want me to go on with this? Yes. All right, then. No more interruptions. <clears throat> At noon, she met her subjects again, this time as their queen. And on these words cut back to Prince Humperdinck. My father's final words were, love her as I loved her, and there would be joy. I present to you your queen, Queen Buttercup. And on his words, we cut to the crowd, and it's gigantic. Cut to the archway, we saw before as Buttercup emerges. Cut to the crowd, suddenly going to its knees, wave after wave of silent, kneeling people, all of them down. Cut to Buttercup, touched as before, but then she seems stunned as we cut to the crowd. Someone is booing, 
The booing gets louder as an ancient woman approaches Buttercup through the crowd, booing every step of the way. Bow! 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 Oh. Why do you do this? Because you had love in your hands and you gave it up! But they would have killed Wesley if I hadn't done it. Your true love lives and you marry another. True love saved her in the fire swamp and she treated it like garbage. And that's what she is, the queen of refuse. So bow down to her if you want, bow to her, bow to the queen of slime, the queen of filth, the queen of putrescence. Boo, boo, rubbish, filth, slime, muck, boo. <sighs> She advances on Buttercup now, who is more and more panicked. Close up, the ancient booer. Louder and louder and louder, she shrieks vituperation at Buttercup, reaching out her old hand towards Buttercup's throat. And Buttercup is as frightened now as Dorothy was when the witch went after her in the Wizard of Oz. And suddenly, we cut to Buttercup, coming out of her nightmare, alone in the castle bedroom, as she frantically grabs a robe and starts to run. It was 10 days till the wedding. The king still lived, but Buttercup's nightmares were growing steadily worse. See, didn't I tell you she'd never marry that rotten humperdink? Yes, you're very smart. Shut up. <laughs> That's a Buttercup bursting into the prince's chambers. Count Rugen stands nearby. It comes to this. I love Wesley. I always have. I know now I always will. If you tell me I must marry you in 10 days, please believe I will be dead by morning. Cut to Prince Humperdinck, just stunned. Finally, softly, he begins to talk. I could never cause you grief. Consider our wedding off. You return this Wesley to his ship? Yes. Then we will simply alert him. Beloved, are, are you certain he still wants you? After all, it was you who did the leaving in the fire swamp, not to mention that pirates are not known to be men of their words. My Wesley will always come for me. Uh, so just a deal. You write four copies of a letter, I will send my four fastest ships, one in each direction. The Dread Pirate Roberts is always close to floor in this time of year. We'll run up the white flag and deliver your message. If Wesley wants you, bless you both. If not, please consider me as an alternative to suicide. Are we agreed? And she nods. Cut to a very thick grove of trees. The trees are unusual in one respect. All of them are extraordinarily heavily knotted. Pull back to reveal Humperty can Rugen walking into the grove of trees. Your princess is really a winning creature. A trifle simple, perhaps, but her appeal is undeniable. Oh, I know. The people are quite taken with her. It's odd, but when I hired Vecini to have her murdered on our engagement day, I thought that was clever. <sighs> but it's going to be so much more moving when I strangle her on our wedding night. Once Gilda is blamed, the nation will be truly outraged. The demand we go to war. They're deeper into the grove now. Rugen is searching around. Now, where is that secret knot? It's impossible to find. Are you coming down into the pit? Wesley's got his strength back. I'm starting him on the machine tonight. Tyrone, you know how much I love watching you work. But I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan my wedding to arrange, my wife to murder, and Gilda to fame for it. I'm swamped. <laughs> Get some rest. If you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. Mm. Rugen smiles and hurries down the stairs as the tree slides back perfectly in the face. Cut to an enormous thing. We can't quite, we can't tell quite what it is or what it does, but somehow it is unsettling. Pull back to reveal Count Rugen dragging Wesley up alongside the thing. Levers and wheels and wires, you name it, it's there. Beautiful, isn't it? The albino starts attaching suction cups to Wesley. It took me half a lifetime to invent it. I'm sure you've discovered my deep and abiding interest in pain. At present, I'm writing the definitive work on the subject, so I want you to be totally honest with me on how the machine makes you feel. <laughs> Cut to a dial, with numbers ranging from a low of one to a high of 50. Rugen goes to it. This being our first try, I'll use the lowest setting. And he turns the dial to one. Cut to Wesley, he has suction cups on his head now, on his temple, on his heart, his hands and feet. He says nothing, keeps control of himself. Cut to Count Rugen, fiddling with his machine a moment more, then he opens the floodgates. Water pours down the chute, turning the wheel, which in turn really gets the machine going. Cut to Wesley, 
and he's lying on the table and he's only flesh and the chains are metal and thick, but such is his desperation. It almost seems he might break them. A terrible sound comes from his throat, an incessant gasping. It seems on coming. Uh, it keeps on coming as we finally cut to Count Rugen. He switches off the machine, picks up a large notebook and pen, sits on the chair. The noise of the machine subsides. Rugen opens the book to a blank page. As you know, the concept of the suction pump is centuries old. Well, really, that's all this is, except that instead of sucking water, I'm sucking life. I've just sucked one year of your life away. I might one day go as high as five, but I really don't know what that would do to you. So let's just start with what we have. What did this do to you? Tell me, and remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. How do you feel? Now at last, we cut to Wesley in anguish, so deep it is dizzying, helpless, he cries. <laughs> Count Rugen watches the tears and starts to write. Interesting. Cut to Humperdinck in his quarters, swamped, piles of papers are strewn all over. Now Yellen, a pale, shifty, quick-eyed man, man appears in the doorway. Yellen. Sire. As chief enforcer of all floors, I trust you with this secret. Killers from Gilda are infiltrating the Thebes forest and plan to murder my bride on our wedding night. My spy network has heard no such news. Cut to Buttercup entering. Any word from Wesley? Cut to the prince and yell and turn to her in that doorway. Too soon, my angel. Patience. He will come for me. Of course. As she glides out. She will not be murdered. On the day of the wedding, I want the thieves forest emptied and every inhabitant arrested. Many of the thieves will resist. Uh, my regular enforcers will be inadequate. Form a brute squad, then. I want the thieves forest emptied before I wed. It won't be easy, sire. Try ruling the world sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to the thieves' forest day. A lot of hollering is going on. The thieves are being rounded up by the brute squad. A large group of large men. Yellen stands on a wagon in the midst of all the scuffling. The day of the wedding arrived. The brute squad had their hands full carrying out Humperdinck's orders. Is everybody out? Almost. There's a Spaniard giving us some trouble. Well, you give him some trouble. Move! And his wagon starts, and as it does, we cut to an ego. Drunk as a skunk, sprawled in front of a hovel, a bottle of brandy in one hand, the six-fingered sword in the other. He looks dreadful, unshaven, puffy-eyed, gaunt. But the way he brandishes the great sword in front of him would give anyone cause for worry. Sinead, will you read Assistant Brute now? And sure. <laughs> I am waiting for you, Vizzini. You told me to go back to the beginning, so I have. This is where I am, and this is where I'll stay. I will not be moved. He takes a long pull from his brandy bottle. He stops as the assistant brute comes, brute comes into view. Hold that. I do not budge. Keep your hold there. <laughs> he waves his sword dangerously. But the prince gave orders. So did Vizzini. When a job went wrong, you went back to the beginning, and this is where, the, where we got the job, so it's the beginning. I'm staying till Vizzini comes. You, brute, come here. I am waiting for Vizzini. You surely are a meanie. Amigo feels a hand on his back, a huge hand. He compares it to his own smaller hand. Hello. It's you. True. Mm -hmm. The assistant brute is just about to club and he goes brains out. Fezzik lets fly with a stupendous punch. The assistant brute takes the full force of the blow right in the chops. It's like he was shot from a cannon as he careen careens backwards out of sight across the street. There is a pause, then a crunching sound as he clearly has come into contact with something hard and immobile. Mm. As it puts an ego down. You don't look so good. You don't smell too good either. Perhaps not. I feel fine. Yeah? And so Fezzik puts an ego down. That's when Inigo faints, and as he does, we cut to an empty alehouse in the thieves' quarter. Inigo sits slumped in a chair while Fezzik spoons him some stew. Fezzik and Inigo were reunited, and as Fezzik nursed his inebriated friend back to health, he told Inigo of Vizzini's death and the existence of Count Rugen, the six-fingered man. Considering Inigo's lifelong search, he handled the news surprisingly well. And he faints again into the stew. Two, cut to two large tubs, one filled with steaming water, the other with water clearly of an icy nature. Without a word, Fezzik stuffed the his head into the icy water. 
Then after a reasonable amount of time, pulls him out, ducks him into the steaming stuff. And a short time after that, pulls him back into the cold again, and then back into the hot. Fezzik took great care in reviving an ego. That's enough. That's enough. Where is this Rugen so I may kill him? He's with the prince in the castle. But the castle gate is guarded by 30 men. How many could you handle? I don't think more than 10. That leaves 20 for me. At my best, I could never defeat that many. I need Vizini to plan. I have no gift for strategy. But Vizini's dead. That to the two of them, silent and bereft. Then a wild look hits an ego. Black. What? Look, he bested you with your strength, your greatness. He bested me with steel. He must have outthought to Bizzini. And a man who can do that uh, can plan my castle's onslaught. And a man who can do that can plan my castle onslaught any day. Let's go. Where? To find the man in black, obviously. But you don't know where he is. Don't bother me with trifles. After 20 years at last, my father's soul will be at peace. Let's do an ego. Close up. There will be blood tonight. <laughs> Cut to Prince Humperdinck's chambers, strewn with maps, etc. Yellen enters and kneels. Rise and report. The thieves' forest is emptied. Uh, Thirty men guard the castle gate. Double it. My princess must be safe. The gate has but one key, and I carry that. He shows the key dangling from a chain around his neck. Just at the moment, Buttercup enters. Oh, my dulcet darling. Tonight we marry. Tomorrow morning, your men will escort us to Florin Channel, where every ship in my armada waits to accompany us on our honeymoon. Every ship but your four fastest, you mean? Prince looks at her blankly for a moment. Every ship but the four you sent? Yes. Yes, of course, naturally not those four. <laughs> your Majesty. Buttercup, <laughs> stand the book. You never sent the ships. Don't bother lying. It doesn't matter. Wesley will come from me anyway. You are a silly girl. Yes, I am a silly girl for not having seen sooner that you were nothing but a coward with a heart full of fear. I would not say such things if I were you. Why not? <laughs> you can't hurt me. Wesley and I are joined by the bonds of love. And you cannot track that. Not with a thousand bloodhounds. And you cannot break it. Not with a thousand swords. And when I say you are a coward, that is only because you are the slimiest weakling ever to crawl the earth. Cut to Humperdinck, jumping at her, yanking her by the hair, starting to pull her along out of control, his words indistinct. I will do a uh. <laughs> Cut to a quarter of the castle. As the prince throws open the the door to Buttercup's room, slams it shut, locks it, breaks into a wild run, and cut to Wesley in the machine. But it's not on. Count Rugen is adding more notes to his book. He looks up as the prince suddenly comes down the steps, raging. You truly love each other, and so you might have been truly happy. Not one couple in a century has that chance, no matter what the storybooks say. And so I think no man in a century will suffer as greatly as you will. And with that, he whirls, turns on the machine, grabs the lever, and cuts to Count Rugen calling out. Not to 50! But it's too late as we cut to Prince Humperdinck shoving the lever all the way up and cut to Wesley's face. And there has never been such pain. The pain grows and grows and with it now, something else has started. The death scream. As the death scream starts to rise, we cut to outside the pit of despair as the sound moves along louder and louder and cut to Yellen and his, and his 60 brutes and they bear it and a few of the brutes turn to each other in fear. And as the screen builds, we cut to Buttercup in her room and she hears the sound, doesn't know what it is, but her arms involuntarily go around her body to try and control the trembling. And the scream still builds. And we cut to establishing shot across the river. There are many people. It is the day of the country's 500th anniversary, but all the people stop as the sound hits them. A few children pale, bolt towards their parents and cut to Inigo and Fezzik trying to make their way through the jammed marketplace, with sun which suddenly quiets as the fading sound comes through. Physic, Physic, listen, do you hear? That is the sound of the ultimate suffering. My heart made that sound when Rugen slaughtered my father. The man in black makes it now. The man in black? His true love is marrying another tonight. So who else has come for the ultimate suffering? Who else has cause for ultimate suffering? Excuse me. It's too crowded. Pardon me, it's important. No one budges if the sound is fading faster. Physic, please! 
Everybody move! <laughs> and the crowd begins to fall away, and he and Inigo start to track the fading sound. Thank you. Cut to a grove of trees near the pit of despair. The albino appears wheeling a barrow. Inigo's sword pushes at his chest. Where is the man in black? The albino shakes his head, says nothing. You get there from this grove, yes? Silence. Fezzik jog his memory. And Fezzik crunches the albino on top of the head as if he had a hammer and he was drilling in a nail. The albino drops without a sound. I'm sorry, Inigo. I didn't mean to jog him so hard. Inigo. <laughs> Cut to Inigo. He kneels, the sword held tight between his hands, eyes closed. He faces the grove of trees, starts to talk, his voice low and strange. Father, I failed you for 20 years. Now our misery can end somewhere. Somewhere close by is a man who can help us. I can find him alone. Me too. Me too. Guide my sword, please. <laughs> right. Eyes still closed. Guide my sword. <laughs> Cut to the grove of trees. As Inigo, eyes shut tight, walks forward, the great sword held in his hands. Fezzik, frightened, follows close behind. Cut to the secret knot that reveals the staircase. Cut to Inigo, walking blind through the grove of trees. He moves to the secret knot, hesitates, then moves past it. Then Inigo stops. For a long moment, he stands frozen. Suddenly, he whirls, eyes still closed, and the sword strikes him dead center into the knot, strikes home dead center into the knot, and nothing. He has failed. In utter despair, he collapses against the tree, against a knot in the tree, against the knot in the tree. It slides away, revealing the staircase. Fezzik and Inigo look at each other and start down. Cut to Wesley, dead by the machine. Fezzik leans over him, listening for a heartbeat, and he looks at Inigo, shakes his head. He's dead. Inigo is in despair. For a moment, he just sags. Just is not fair. Grandpa, Grandpa, wait! Cut to the kid's room. He is terribly excited and looks stronger than we've yet seen him. He's dead? I mean, he didn't mean dead. His grandfather says nothing, just sits there. Wesley's only faking, right? You want me to read this or not? Cut to the kid, close up. Who gets Humperdinck? I don't understand. Who kills Prince Humperdinck? At the end, somebody's got to do it. Is it Inigo? Who? Nobody. Nobody kills him. He lives. You mean he wins? Jesus, Grandpa, what did you <laughs> read me this thing for? And he desperately fights for control. You know, you've been very sick, and you're taking this story very seriously. I think we better stop now. Closes the book and starts to get up. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Sit down, all right? <laughs> okay. All right, now let's see. Where were we? Oh, yes, in the pit of despair. Cut to Inigo in the pit of despair. We're back in the pit. The same shot as before. For a moment, he just sags. Well, we Montoyos have never taken defeat easily. Come along, Fezzik. Bring the body. The body? Have you any money? I have a little. I just hope it's enough to buy a miracle. That's all. As Fezzik takes the corpse, following Inigo up the stairs, we cut to a hovel, dusk. Inigo, Fezzik, Wesley approach the door. They knock. From inside the hovel, a little man's voice is heard. The number of your, your old man was really old. He'd resemble this guy. Go away! Inigo pounds again. What? What? Are you the Miracle Max who worked for the king all those years? The king's stinking son fired me, and thank you so much for bringing up such a painful subject. <laughs> While you're at it, why don't you give me a nice paper cut and pour lemon juice on it? We're closed! Shut the window, they rap on the door. Beat it, or I'll call the brood squad. I'm on the brood squad. You are the brood squad. <laughs> we need a miracle. It's very important. Look, I'm retired. And besides, why would you want someone the king's stinking son fired? I might kill whoever you want me a miracle. He's already dead. He is, huh? Yeah, I'll take a look. Bring him in. <laughs> Again, locks the door and lets him in. Cut to Inigo and Fezzik hurrying inside. Fezzik carries Wesley, who is just starting to stiffen up a little. He lays Wesley down across the bench by the fireplace, picks Wesley's arm up, and lets it drop limp. I've seen this. Studies Wesley a moment, checking here, uh, checking there. Sir, sir. Eh? We're really in a terrible rush. Don't rush me, Sonny. You rush a miracle, man, you get red in miracles. You got money? 65. Sheesh. I never worked for so little, except once, and that was a very noble cause. This is noble, sir. His wife is crippled. His children are on the brink of destruct, starvation. 
<laughs> Are you a rotten liar? I need him to help avenge my father, murdered these 20 years. Yeah, your first story was better. Where's that bellows? Hey, he probably owes you money, huh? Well, I'll ask him. He goes to get a huge bellows. He's dead. He can't talk. Oh, look who knows so much. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. And Ego does. Max inserts the bellows in Wesley's mouth and starts to pump. Now, mostly dead is slightly alive. Now, all dead, well, with all dead, that's usually only one thing you can do. What's that? That's pumping. Go through his clothes and look for loose change. They're pumping again. Hey, hello in there. Hey, what's so important? What, what do you got that's worth living for? And as he presses lightly on Wesley's chest. True. Oh. Uh, everybody stares at Wesley lying there on the bench. True love. You heard him. You cannot ask for a more noble cause than that. Sonny, true love is the greatest thing in the world. Except for a nice MLT, a mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich, where the mutton is nice and lean and the tomato is ripe. They're so perky. I love that. But that's not what he said. He distinctly said to blave. And as we all know, to blave means to bluff. So you're probably playing cards and he cheated. Liar! 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 Valerie, in ancient fury, storms out of the back room and towards Mirror. Get back, witch! I'm not a witch, I'm your wife! But after what you just said, I'm not even sure I want to be that anymore. Yeah, you never had it so good. True love, he said. True love, Max. My God. Don't say another word, Valerie. <laughs> Ever since Prince Humperdick fired him, his confidence is shattered. Why'd you say that name? You promised me that you would never say that name. What? Humperdick? Humperdick. Uh, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. A life expiring and you don't even have the decency to say why you won't help. Nobody's hearing nothing. (laughs) But this is uh, Buttercup's true love. If you heal him, he will stop Humperdinck's wedding. Shut up. Wait, wait. I make him better? Humperdinck suffers? Humiliations galore. That is a noble cause. Give me the 65. I'm on the job. And as Valerie shrieks excitedly, we cut to this lump. It is somewhat smaller than a tennis ball. Pull back to reveal Max and Valerie, exhausted, looking at the lump with beautific pleasure. As Valerie cooking utensil, as Valerie cooking utensil in hand covers the thing with what looks like chocolate, Inigo and Fezzik stare at the thing too, but more dubiously. That's a miracle pill. Max nods. The chocolate covering makes it go down easier, but you have to wait 15 minutes for full potency, and you shouldn't go swimming after for at least what? An hour. Yeah, an hour. A good hour, yeah. <laughs> you know, as Fezzik takes Wesley, who is stiff as a board now. Thank you for everything. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. Think it'll work? Think it would take a miracle. Bye! They wave, trying to look happy. We cut to Fezzik, Inigo, and Wesley on the top of the outer wall of the castle. They look down to the front gates of the castle. The 60 brutes are visible. Fezzik is thunderstruck by how many brutes there are. Upset, he turns to Inigo, who is concentrating unsuccessfully, trying to prop Wesley against the wall. Inigo, there's more than 30. What's the difference? We've got him. Help me here. We've got him. Ah, there it is. We've got him. Help me here. We'll have to force feed him. Has it been 15 minutes? We can't wait. The wedding's in half an hour and we must strike in the hustle and the bustle beforehand. During this, Fezzik, using all of his strength, has managed to get Wesley into a right angled sitting position while Inigo brings out the miracle pill. Uh, Tilt his head back. Open his mouth. How long do we have to wait before we know if the miracle works? Cuts to Inigo, pill in hand, he drops it into Wesley's mouth. Your guess is as good as mine. I'll beat you both apart. I'll take you both together. <laughs> Guess not very long. Amigo and Fezzik react. Wesley is the only one not, am- not amazed. Why won't my arms move? He sits there, immobile, mm-hmm. like a ventriloquist's dummy. You've been mostly dead all day. We had Miracle Max make a pill to bring you back. Who are you? Are we enemies? Why am I on this wall? Where's Buttercup? Let me explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. Buttercup is marrying Humberdink in a little less than half an hour, so we all we have to do is get in, break up the wedding, steal the princess, make our escape after I kill Count Rugen. That doesn't leave much time for Dilly Dally. He's watching his fingers, one of them twitches now. You've just wiggled your finger, that's wonderful. 
Mm. I've always been a quick healer. What are our liabilities? There is uh, but one working castle gate. Bezik helps Inigo raise Wesley just high enough so he can see for himself. And it is guarded by 60 men. And our assets? Your brains, physics strength, my steel. Cuts to Wesley, absolutely stunned. That's it? Impossible. If I had a month to plan, maybe I could come up with something, but this... Shakes his head from side to side. Cuts in Inigo. You just shook your head. Doesn't that make you happy? Mm. My brains, his steel, and your strength against 60 men, and you think a little head jiggle is supposed to make me happy? I mean, if we only had a wheelbarrow, that would be something. What if we put that wheelbarrow that Obino had? Uh, over the albino, I think. Well, why didn't you list that among our assets in the first place? What I wouldn't give for a holocaust cloak. There we cannot help you. Will this do? <laughs> Where did you get that? At Miracle Max's. It fits so nice, he said I could keep it. <laughs> all right, all right. Come on, help me up. And you go and Fezzik do. Now I'll need a sword eventually. Why? You can't even lift one. True, but that's hardly common knowledge, is it? Thank you. Now, there may be problems once we're inside. I'll say, how do we find the Count? Once I do, how do I find you again? Once I find you again, how do we escape? Don't pester him. He's had a hard day. Right, right, sorry. Cut to a shot of the three of them in profile. They move along the wall in silence for a time. Then these words come to us on the wind. Inigo. What? I hope we win. (laughs) <laughs> buttercup in her bridal gown and she's incredible it's not just her beauty there's a tranquility about her now pull back to reveal the prince fastening a pearl necklace around her you don't seem excited my little muffin should i be brides often are i'm told i do not marry tonight cut to buttercup and she couldn't seem more serene my wesley will save me cut to her wesley looking down on the gate with an ego and fezzik Cut to the main gate of the castle, and Yellen, standing there, flanked by his 60 brutes. Cut to Wesley and Inigo and Fezzik, looking out at the enemy. This is it. Inigo and Fezzik shake hands. Wesley can't even do that, but after a bit of rocking back and forth, he manages to get enough momentum to catapult his arm over onto his friends, and cut to an absolutely gem-like little chapel. Pull back to reveal the most intelligent-looking, the most impressive-appearing clergyman imaginable. Buttercup and Humperdinck kneel before the clergyman. Behind them sit the mumbling old king and queen. Standing in the back is Count Ferugian. Four guards are in position flanking the chapel door. Mowage. (laughs) Mowage is what brings us together today. (laughs) As an impediment that would stop a clock. (laughs) Mowage. The blessed arrangement that dream with him a dream. (laughs) And now from outside the castle, there begins to come a commotion. And then, Stand your ground, men. Stand your ground. Cut to the brutes and yelling by the gate. For it is indeed they who are making the commotion, frightened, pointing. Stand your ground. Cut to their POV. And it is a bit unnerving. A giant seems to be floating towards them out of the darkness. A giant in a strained cloak and with a voice that would crumble walls. I am the dread pirate Roberts. There will be no survivors. Cut to Fezzik. And he seems to look as he's standing in a wheelbarrow as Inigo, hidden behind him, busts a gut by pushing it and supporting Wesley. No! Not yet. Cut to the giant floating closer. My men are here, and I am here, but soon you will not be here. (laughs) Cut to Yellen, keeping the brutes in position or trying to, shouting orders, instructions, and as yet the brutes hold. Now, cut to Inigo and Wesley. Inigo struggles bravely under their combined weight. Ow! Light him. Cut to the brutes as the giant bursts suddenly happily into flames. The dread Baron Roberts takes no survivors. All your worst nightmares are about to come true. <laughs> cut to the chapel. Their impressive clergyman plows on. <clears throat> When love, true love, will follow you forever. <laughs> Turning quickly, giving a sharp nod to Count Rugen, who immediately takes off out of the chapel with the Ford guards as we cut to Fezzik, flaming and scary as hell. 
Your dad my waffles is here for your songs. <laughs> suddenly the brute starts just screaming and take off in a wild panic. Stay where you are! Stay, I said stay where you are! Got to inside the chapel. So, treasure your world. Skip to the end. Have you the wing? Comforting what's out the ring. The screams are very loud outside. Here comes my Wesley now. Got to Fezzik as he pulls off the Holocaust clip. Fezzik, the port, the portcullis. <laughs> Fezzik rushes forward, grabbing the portcullis, which is indeed closing quickly. Fezzik grabs the gate and swings the tonnage back upward. Yellen just watches in fear. Cut to the chapel as Humperdinck shows the ring on Buttercup's finger. Your Wesley is dead. Buttercup only smiles, shakes her head. I killed him myself. Then why is there fear behind your eyes? Cut to Prince Humperdinck, and she's right, it's there. Cut to Yellen. Pressed against the main gate, Wesley, and Ego and Fezzik close in. Give us the gate key. I have no gate key. Fezzik, tear his arms off. Oh, oh, you mean this gate key. <laughs> and he whips it out and hands it to Fezzik. Cut to Humberdeek and Buttercup and the impressive, impressive clergyman. <clears throat> and do you, Princess Boboko? Man and wife say man and wife. Man and wife. Escort the bride to the honeymoon suite. I will be there shortly. And as he dashes off, cut to Buttercup, standing there, dazed. He didn't come. Cut to Count Rugen and his four warriors, racing through the castle as they reach a complex intersection of several corridors. Rugen stops, incredulous, as we cut to Wesley, Amigo, and Fezzik, moving towards them. Actually, Fezzik is dragging Wesley, who is, in turn, dragging Yellen's sword like a stiff dog leash. Wesley simply has him the strength to raise him. Cut to Count Rugen as the confrontation is about to start. Kill the Dark One and the Giant, but leave the third for questioning. And as his warriors attack, Inigo goes wild, and maybe the warriors, go warriors are good. Maybe they're even better than that, but they never get, get a chance to show it because there is something now. This is Inigo gone mad, and the six-fingered sword has never flashed faster, and the fourth warrior is dead before the first one has even hit the floor. There is a pause, then... Hello. My name is Anigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Cut to Count Rugen. For just a moment, he stands there, sword in hand. Then he does a most unexpected, team, unexpected thing. He turns and runs the hell away. <laughs> Anigo, momentarily surprised, then taking off after him, leaving Wesley and Fezzik to exchange curious looks, and Rugen running through a half-open, heavy wooden door, shutting it and locking it just as Anigo throws himself against it. He tries again. No kind of chance. Fezzik, I need your... Cut to Fezzik with Wesley, who is still unable to walk under his own power. He calls back. I can't leave him alone. Cut to an ego, desperately pounding at the heavy door. I, he's getting away from me, Fezzik. Please, Fezzik. Cut to Fezzik and Wesley. I'll be right back. And he props Wesley up against a large suit of armor and takes off towards the intersection where Inigo's voice came from. Cut to Inigo, still hammering the door. Fezzik approaches, gestures for him to stop, and with one mighty swipe of his mighty hands, the door crumbles. Thank you. As Inigo flies through, as Fezzik's hand heads back towards Wesley, cut to Buttercup walking with the king and queen. The queen, more sprightly, is several paces ahead. Strange wedding. Yes, yeah, very strange wedding. Come along. Buttercup gently stops the king and places a kiss on his forehead. He's very surprised and pleased. What was that for? Because you've always been so kind to me, and I won't be seeing you again since I'm killing myself once we reach the honeymoon suite. Oh, won't that be nice? <laughs> she kissed me. <laughs> On those words, kind of cut to you. Count Rugen, he's running, dashing through corridors as he glances back. Cut to an ego behind him, coming like a streak, and cut to the intersection with a large suit of armor and Fezzik gaping, staring at all these choices, trying to piece together the puzzle of the missing Wesley. Cut to Count Rugen, flashing out of one room, down a staircase, picking up his face. He pulls out a deadly-looking dagger with a sharp point and a triangular-shaped blade and sprints on and cut to Inigo, closing the gap closer, closer. And he's down the stairs and heading into the dining hall and, and cut to Count Rogan, through, throwing the dagger. Cut to Inigo, trying like hell to get out of the way, but no, and it sticks deep in his stomach and he hurdles back helplessly against the wall of the room. His eyes glazed, blood coming from his womb. The room is going white on him. Sorry, father. I tried. I tried. Cut to Count Rugen, looking across the room at Inigo. 
he stares in Inigo's face and then touches his own cheeks as memory comes. You must be that little Spanish brat I taught a lesson to all those years ago. It's simply incredible. Have you been chasing me your whole life only to fail now? I think that's the worst thing I ever heard. How marvelous. Inigo sinks. Cut to Buttercup, shutting the door of the honeymoon suite, crossing quietly to the far wall where she sits at a table, opens a jeweled box, and takes out a very deadly looking dagger. She seems very much at peace as she touches the knife to her bosom. There's a shortage of perfect breasts in the world. Pity the damage yours. <laughs> Whirls as we cut to Wesley very lying on the bed. Yellen Sword is behind him. His voice sounds just fine, but he does not move. Buttercup. Leaps to the bed, covering him with kisses. Wesley is helpless. Oh, Wesley, darling. Wesley, why won't you, why won't you hold me? Gently. At a time like this, that's all you can think to say, gently? Gently. And she lets him go, thumping his head against the headboard. And we cut to Count Rugen, looking very much surprised. Good heavens, are you still trying to win? Pull back to reveal, and Nigo, struggling feebly, pulling the dagger from his stomach, holding the wound with his left hand. Rugen is pushing off from the table, sword in hand, moving in to kill an ego. You've got an overdeveloped sense of vengeance. It's going to get you in trouble someday. Nigo watches the Count approach, and the Count flicks his sword at an ego's heart, and there's not much an ego can do, just kind of vaguely parry the thrust with the six-fingered sword, and Count Rugen's blade sinks deeply in into, into an ego's left shoulder. An ego doesn't seem to feel it, his other agonies are so much worse. Cut to the Count, stepping back, going for the heart again. Count to Inigo, and as this, blow as this blow comes, he's trying to use the wall for support and forcing himself to his feet. And it's not a roaring success of an attempt, but he does at least make some progress. And again, he manages to parry the thrust. As this time, Rugen Sword runs through his right arm. Again, Inigo doesn't seem to mind, doesn't even feel it. Cut to Count Rugen, stepping back, for just a moment, watching as Inigo continues to inch his way to his feet. And then, just before the Count is about to strike again, Inigo manages a little flick of his own, and Rugen hadn't expected it. And he jumps back, makes a little involuntary cry of surprise. You cut to Inigo, slowly pushing away from the wall. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Cut to to Count Rugen, suddenly going into a fierce attack, striking with great power and precision, for he is a master swordsman, and he forces Inigo back easily, drives him easily into the wall, but he does not penetrate Inigo's defenses. None of the Count's blows get home, as the Count steps back a moment, cut to Inigo, pushing slowly off the wall again. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepared to die. Cut to the Count, and again he attacks, slashing with wondrous skill, but none of his blows get through. Slowly, Inigo again moves forward. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Stop saying that! That's the Count Rugen, retreating more quickly around the table. Inigo drives through the Count's left shoulder now, thrusts home where the Count had gotten him, then another move where his blade enters the Count's right shoulder, the same spot Inigo was wounded. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. No! Offer me money. Now the six-fingered sword strikes, and there is a slash bleeding along one of Rugen's cheeks. Yes. Power two, promise me that. The great sword flashes again, and now there is a parallel slash bleeding on Rugen's other cheek. All that I have and more, please. Offer me everything I ask for. Anything you want. I want my father back, you son of a bitch! And on that, we cut to Inigo, and almost too fast for the eye to follow, his sword strikes one final time. Cut to Count Rugen, crying out in fear and panic as the sword hits home, dead center. Uh, uh, uh. And Inigo and R Rugen, the sword clear through the Count. They're almost frozen like that for a moment. Then Inigo withdraws his sword, and as the Count pitches down, cut to Rugen, lying dead. His skin is ashen, and the blood still pours from the parallel cuts on his cheeks, and his eyes are bulging wide, full of fear. Cut to Inigo, staring at Rugen, and now Inigo does something we have never seen him do before. He smiles. Hold just for a moment on Inigo smiling, and then we cut to inside the honeymoon suite. <laughs> Wesley why, lies as before. Not a muscle has moved, and his head is still on the headboard, yelling sword at his side. But her cup is alongside the bed. Her eyes never leave his face. Oh, Wesley, will you ever forgive me? 
What hideous sin have you committed, Ruth Lately? I got married. I didn't want to. It all happened so fast. It never happened. What? It never happened. But it did. I was there. This old man said, man and why. Did you, <laughs> <laughs> did you say, I do? Well, no. We sort of skipped that part. Then you're not married. If you didn't say it, you didn't do it. Wouldn't you agree, your highness? Cut to Humperdinck entering the room, staring at them, he pulls out his sword. A technicality that will be shortly remedied, but first things first, to the death. No, to the pain. Don't think I'm quite familiar with that phrase. I'll explain, and I'll use small words so that you'll be sure to understand, you warthog-faced buffoon. That may be the first time in my life a man has dared insult me. Arthur Wesley lying there uncomfortable, his words quiet at first. It won't be the last. To the pain means the first thing you lose will be your feet below the ankles, then your hands at the wrists, next your nose. Captain Humperdinck gripping his sword, watching. And then my tongue, I suppose. I killed you too quickly the last time, a mistake I don't mean to duplicate tonight. I wasn't finished. The next thing you lose will be your left eye, followed by your right. And then my ears, I understand. Let's get on with it. Wrong. Your ears you keep, and I'll tell you why. Cut to Humperdinck, and now he stops, and the look that was in his eyes at the wedding, that look of fear, is starting to return. So that every shriek of every child at seeing your hideousness will be yours to cherish. Every, every babe that weeps at your approach, every woman who cries out, Dear God, what is that thing? will echo in your perfect ears. That is what to the pain means. It means I leave you in anguish, wallowing in freakish misery forever. Cut to Humperdinck, doing his best to hide the fear that keeps building inside him. I think you're bluffing. Cut to Wesley lying there staring at him. It's possible, pig. I might be bluffing. It's conceivable, you miserable vomitous mass, that I'm only lying here because I lack the strength to stand. Then again, perhaps I have the strength after all. Now, slowly, Wesley begins to move. His body turns, his feet go to the floor. He starts to stand, cut to Humperdinck, staring, eyes wide. <laughs> cut to Wesley, now he's standing, sword in fighting position. Drop your sword. Cut to Humperdinck, and he's so panicked, he doesn't know whether to pee or wind his watch. He throws his sword to the floor. Have a cut to Wesley, speaking to Buttercup as Humperdinck sits. Tie him up, make it as tight as you like. And as she sets to work, cut to Inigo, entering, looking around. Inigo. Oh! <laughs> where's Fe where's Fezzik? I thought he was with you. No. In that case... His balance betrays him. Help him. Why does Wesley need helping? Because he has no strength. Cut to Humperdinck, and now he starts wrestling mightily with his bonds. <laughs> I knew it! I knew you were bluffing! I knew he was bluffing. <laughs> Shall I dispatch him for you? Thank you, but no. Whatever happens to us, I want him to live a long life alone with his cowardice. Nero, Nero, where are you? They look at each other and then move to the balcony. And cut to Fezzik, leading four great white horses. He glances up, sees them on the balcony. Ah, there you are, Nero. I saw the prince's I saw the prince's stables, and there they were, four white horses. And I thought, there are four of us. If we can ever find the lad. Hello, lad. So I took them with me, in case we ever bumped into each other. I guess we just did. Cut to Nico and Wesley and Barcup looking down at Fezzik. Fezzik, you did something right. Don't worry, I won't let it go to my head. And as he holds out his great arms, we cut to something unexpected and very lovely. Buttercup floating through the air. What's happening, of course, is that she's jumping from the balcony so Fezzik can catch her. But her fall is in slow motion, so you might think she was flying. Wesley and Inigo, watching as Fezzik catches Buttercup. You know, it is very strange. I haven't been in the revenge business so long, so now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. Have you ever considered piracy? You'd make a wonderful Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, now, to the four glorious white horses with their four riders, triumphantly racing through the night. We cut to Buttercup and Wesley, and at last, their trials are over. They stop. They rode to freedom, and as dawn arose, Wesley and Buttercup knew they were safe. A wave of love swept over them, and as they reached for each other, 
as Buttercup and Wesley begin their ultimate kiss, cut to the kid's bedroom, the grandfather stops reading. What? What? No, it's it's kissing again. You don't want to hear it. I don't mind so much. He gestures the grandfather to read. Okay. <clears throat> cut to Buttercup and Wesley locked in deep, pure, and passionate kiss. Since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses that were rated the most passionate, the most mm -hmm. pure. This one left them all behind. The end. Cut to the kids' room. The grandfather snaps the book closed. Now I think you ought to go to sleep. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So long. Grandpa? Maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. And his wow. smile is enough as the grandfather steps out of the door, tipping his hat. Final fade out. The end. Yeah! yeah. yeah. Grandpa has the same love for his grandson as oh, good. <laughs> oh, the same beautiful romantic love. <laughs> there ain't no different kind of love. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was so fun. You guys oh, what were so incredible. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And special shout out to Alec for the most. Yeah. Questions. Hell yeah. <laughs> so many cut to. That was dense. Oh. That so. rival. That rival <laughs> clue. So I don't have a clue. <laughs> if I <laughs> clue was more. <laughs> clue still happening. On another live stream right now. It's all stuck in clue. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, Thanks for having us. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. No, they all did. They're saying wonderful things and they loved it. Oh, good. Beautiful. All right. Everybody have a good Friday night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye. Bye gang. <laughs>